Nüüd liigume edasi ülelahe külalise ettekande juurde professor Tütti Solandaus on siin selleks, et rääkida meile huvitavast ettevõtmisest Soomes, mis sai algus aastal 2001 nimelt on tegemist tõlgin nüüd võibolla kohmakalt, aga efektiivse pere ja laste programmiga, mis keskendub siis sellele, et mis moodi ennetada, nõustada, abistada lapsi, kelle peres on mitte ennetada neid lapsi, aga ennetada neid probleemi, millega nad silmitsi võivad seista peredes, kus on üks vanematest või mõlemad vanemad vaimse tervise hädadega. Nii et professor Solantaus, palume lavale, saate temalt kuulda siis lähemalt selle kõige kohta. Good day, <laughs> good afternoon. I am very uh, um, delighted and pleased to be here and to be invited to, to this uh, symposium or conference or how you call it. Uh, it's, it's really um, the work that we have done and the work that, that um, I personally have done is, is something that is very close to my heart and it's, it's wonderful to be able to, to talk about it. And let me see if I can... So the, the topic is breaking down the generational cycle of mental health problems. And we have come a long way. You know, it's not long since there was nothing for these families, except maybe taking children uh, out of home to, to uh, orphanages when parents had problems. And then we had uh, started to have epidemiological research, which showed the risk. And so we became worried, and that was it. <laughs> and the next thing was, and that's quite recent actually, that we got interested in, in research and, and also in, in practice, on resilience. And, and how, how is it that some children and some families fare well, and in some families there are problems for the children. And when, when uh, research was uh, carried out, long enough, we had findings, and it was possible to, to uh, develop preventive interventions. And so there was, uh, we moved to hope and action in this field. And then right now the next step is to move beyond helping individuals and families to changing systems, to changing the service systems. And I will talk about, uh, also about that. Well, first, the, the epidemiological research. Professor Sir Michael Rutter made his own PhD uh, already in 1966 on this topic and, and documented the risk for children. And he also mentioned the role of adult psychiatry. And so what is it, 50, 60 years <laughs> since this problem was put on the table and we're still discussing what to do? And then Bill Beardsley is one of the, one of the grand uh, uh, scientists and clinicians who has, has uh, developed preventive interventions and, and followed the, the families. And, um, and his studies and others have shown that the children have a two, three times risk compared to, to families where, where parents are well. And Myrna Wiseman is another grand lady who has uh, devoted a lot of her career in this field. And she uh, has already a three-generation study, which shows that there's a risk also for somatic illness, especially uh, heart disease, high blood pressure, and so on. And, the, and, and her research shows also the, the strength or the, well, the strength or ex extent of the generational cycle. 
But it's not only, only parents who have psychiatric problems. P parents can also have severe uh, somatic problems, and children in those families also have an increased risk, especially if the parents also have psychiatric problems. And how about this population of children? Children of in incarcerated parents, parents who are in prisons and, and uh, suffering from or uh, have a criminal um, background. And um, a lot of these, in Finland, most of these of our prisoners have also a psychiatric history. And so there is also the intergenerational cycle of, of mental health problems and also behavioral problems. This is an, an, a British study of boys, and you can see how, how strong the generational cycle is. And so many children, so many, many children are living in, in families where parents have mental health problems. And this is, of course, due to the fact that mental health problems are very common. And, and I think that, that research already shows that at least two-thirds of us will have, have had or will have mental health problems or disorders during our lifetime. And so what we're dealing with is ordinary problems in ordinary families. It might be our family, it might be our sisters or brothers' family, our neighbors, our friends, our uh, uh, work companions. It's us. It's not them, but it is us we're talking about. And the adverse outcomes for children range from different uh, mental health problems and disorders to educational problems and, and relationship issues. And then in adulthood also, unemployment, poverty, loneliness. Of course, we used to think that this is a genetic issue, because so it seemed. But now we know that, there, that no psychiatric disorder has only a gene genetic basis, but it is a very uh, many-level interaction or interplay between genes and the environment. Which means that, that there is a chance for prevention, because if we can change the environment, then we can prevent the outcome of this inter you know, the negative outcome of this interplay. And how and what is the environment? The environment in this family is, you know, the family issues and the mental health problems. But also many other things, relationship issues, parenting problems, and then economic problems, unemployment, poverty, and stigma, which we already heard about, a very good presentation. Mm -hmm. And so the generational risk is the, is the result of all these things, not only the mental health problems. And here's a, a picture of, of how the parental stress, the outside, family issues actually travel within the family to reach children and children's well-being. But many families and children are doing fine in spite of there being problems. And this, the 40% the of children uh, comes from William Beardsley's study which is a high, high risk, but yet it means that 60% of the kids are fine. And this is what we tend to forget when we work in health and social services, because we're all trained to see the problems <laughs> and recognize them. So it is possible to be a good parent and provide a good home, even with mental health problems. So this is one thing that I'd like you to remember <laughs> and take to your <laughs> work. And there are in effective preventive interventions. In, in 2012, the first uh, meta-analysis was carried out, which showed that prevention is possible. And there were 13 studies out of um, actually thousands that they selected to be of high quality. And I'm very proud that our own study was amongst these 13 studies.
and the risk for new disorders decreased by 40%, which is quite a number. But the main thing is that prevention is possible. <laughs> so, the big picture is clear. There is substantial risk and substantial resilience. And there is evidence-based methods for prevention and promotion. So what are we waiting? <laughs> in Finland, we started the Effective Child and Family Program in 2001. And it is a nationwide development. We have developed uh, interventions, research. We have studied the interventions and implemented them across Finland. And it, it was funded by the Ministry of Social Affairs, Health and Social Affairs, and carried out in the National Institute for Health and Welfare. And these are very important things for our program because, because this meant that we had the responsibility to take it over the country. And we had the possibility to do so. And the legislation in Finland since the 1980s has obliged services, health and social services, serving adults also to take care of the needs of the patients or clients, children. So we have a legal basis for this work. And so the aim was the prevention of the cycle, and especially children's mental health problems. And in, in practice, to help families and children live as good a life as possible when a parent has problems. So we are not doing treatment. We help the families to get the, the treatment they need, but we are not doing treatment. But we help them to live with, with the problems, no matter what the problems are. And, and so we have um, you know, developed these methods and studied them. And we started with mental health problems, psychiatric problems. But very quickly uh, extended to physical health, cancer, parents' cancer especially, and then substance abuse problems, economical problems, poverty. And in, in 2011, the um, national, um, I don't know how to translate it, the, the office that deals with, you know, is above all the prisons and, and the whole criminal system, invited us to develop programs also for, for families where parents are in prison. And then the uh, National uh, Mig Migration uh, Office or whatever called upon us a couple of years ago to, pre to develop programs for refugee centers. And we have, these are all services for adults, but then we also, these children are also in kindergartens and schools, and we started, uh, we developed uh, a program for, for uh, kindergartens and schools also. And here's our method family. They share the same principles, uh, which is respect for the parent who has problems. It's prevention. It's looking up, you know, forward, not backwards. I mean, not in the back, you know, the problem history, but, but uh, finding ways to go forward and, and have a good life. The let's talk about children is the one that I will talk more about. It's our low threshold, kind of the first level of intervention. And family talk intervention comes from the United States. It's Bill Beardsley's intervention, dealing with the whole family. And, and we have developed a network meeting, Let's Talk Network Meeting, which builds a network or scaffolding around the child using uh, the, the family's own social network, the child's so social network, the professionals and, and services, whatever is needed, NGOs. And there are groups for, you know, let's talk, uh, groups for hospitalized parents in some psychiatric hospitals and support, Verti support groups for parents and children and family courses for children and parents together. And the guidebooks. Oh, by the way, I have some guidebooks with me. So would you go and get my, my, my bag? I forgot to take them out. It's, it's right, it's where the um, name tags are. It's, it's the carrying thing. It's the only thing there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. 
so the let's talk about children is our is our low threshold method and which is developed initially for psychiatric services so that and we think that every every patient uh, yes that's the right one <laughs> thank you you can look at them <laughs> yes so it is and let's talk about children um, is a discussion with uh, the parent so that the person treating the parent has a discussion about the, the children with the, with the client with the patient and and it's not on only an assessment of the child it is actually the ends up with a plan you know how how the parent can support the child and then if if uh, it is something that the parent thinks that they they uh, are not able to do that they need extra help then the network work, uh, meeting is called to to collect the people around who can support the family and the child and here's here's the uh, kind of the chart in a way where we have the let's talk discussion first and then the network meeting if it is needed and then there are other preventive the family intervention can be the next one if if that is needed the peer groups can be the one and the, and the groups uh, in the psychiatric hospital and also if treatment is needed of course that uh, is also arranged and then you can move between these these different uh, activities so the let's talk about children has been spread has been spread um, to other countries as well and the theoretical background is is we uh, kind of follow the ecological transactional model of child development and resilience which means I think it is very very well known that child development happens in daily interactions, activities, but not only at home with parents, but in all ecological contexts, which we call developmental contexts, which is at home, daycare, school, and the social environment, and also by the screen, although we don't have uh, much of the screen. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, it's, it's difficult still to understand uh, how much and what, how the screen actually uh, influences child development. However, the importance of the daily interactions and activities and the flow of everyday life becomes uh, it becomes a focus. That's and and we know that parental mental illnesses disrupt the the flow of the everyday life and the in, has an Im impact on the interactions. And here we w we're going to um, kind of move into a family a little bit who has mental health problems. So when, when we s you know, start having problems, mental health issues, things that used to be easy are not easy anymore. And parents' and children's needs might be different. The father needs to be alone and in peace and the little Tommy wants to play football. The parent's mind might be totally somewhere else. And um, simple things that used to be okay at home are overwhelming. And children are puzzled. Impulse, is, impulse control is something that, with most mental health problems, and also stressed out parents. <laughs> I think this is something that everyone who is a parent, who has been a child of some parents, <laughs> you know, recognize. And then the children ask, was it me?
And parents might also um, some other needs like uh, drugs might take precedence over children's uh, needs or what they have promised. And children are frustrated, angry. And also lonely, because usually these things are something that you cannot really talk about with anyone. So what is needed in the family? And these are the things that the, the preventive interventions are based on. Parents need to understand the interactional consequences of the disorder in the family. They usually know the symptoms because the doctor asks, the psychologist the doctor asks for, what are your symptoms? But what are the interactional consequences is another thing. And, and they need to understand children's experiences and to support children to cope with the parents' symptoms. These are the aims of our interventions. And for the children, they need to feel understood. Oh, that's a spelling error. <laughs> understood and supported by their parents. And to be able to make sense of what, hap what is happening at home and to the parents. And then to be supported to cope with the parents' symptoms by both parents. That the parents help the children to cope. That I help my child to cope with my problems. And finally, parents and children joined problem solving. Sitting down and, and, and thinking about what, what to do when I cannot get up in the morning when you have to go to school. How should we deal with this? The children have good ideas. Parents, um, and, and we know that a part of resilience is also uh, shared problem solving. And so here it is. Parents, children, and them together, joint problem solving. I know, at least in Finland, that we have a tradition of, uh, you know, that parents and many think that children should be saved or spared of all problems, that childhood should be carefree. And that's why uh, parents often uh, try to behave as if nothing is going on, nothing special. And so this, you know, what we have learned from uh, resilience studies is, is kind of counter, it seems counter to that. And, and in, in a way it is. It's sharing, it's being open and, and finding solutions together. Okay, so when we, uh, in the family, there, the, the profile of parenting in everyday life is, goes up and down. There are things that go okay and things that, that uh, are problems. And I don't know if you know how how uh, common or how much uh, there's been a discussion in Estonia about early prevention. In Finland, it's 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 been very very uh, uh, strong and and um, dominant, and it's it's usually risk based early prevention, so that you uh, we're all trained to identify problems very early in a minor state so that we can interfere and prevent them growing stronger. And this means that your image of the family is like this, if you, if you focus on the, on the uh, risks. And this is not what we're <laughs> how we approach the families. Because if you look at the families close enough, when the parents have problems, there are also very nice things. Times when, when parents and children enjoy each other, have fun. There's a sense of togetherness. And very touching situations where parents uh, you know, discuss issues with kids. And uh, parents themselves, they recognize their problems, but they also say that, that you know, something... Uh, very often that they have uh, learned to focus or they have, uh, the problems have made them into a team, which is one of the best things for these kids to happen. 
And resilience is not a, a quality of a characteristic of a child or, or a, a parent, but it is also about interaction. It comes out from the interaction between the individual and the environment. And it means that basically the things are okay, or at least some things are okay, <laughs> even if there are problems. And so what we do in the Let's Talk is that we, we identify the, um, the good things, which we call strengths, the things that go okay, and then those that have problems, and we call them vulnerabilities. So you go through the child's life at home and in kindergarten school and in a peer group, uh, and, and kind of draw this picture in a way in your mind. And, and then you make an action plan with the parent. How to increase the strengths, the good things, and what to do in the vulnerabilities. And of course the vulnerabilities are often to do with, with parents' mental health problems and how to cope with those situations with the parents' symptoms. And we have done research on, on, uh, on the Let's Talk. We compared the, um, the family talk intervention from the United States and the Let's Talk. In an, it's an RCT study. And we studied the safety, feasibility, and effectiveness of these interventions. And safety is something that, that I always emphasize because we are not in prevention, we are not to do harm for the families. And in these, these situations, we might increase sense of stigma, we might make the parent more anxious when we talk about children and the problems in parenting, or increase their depression. And so we wanted to study that, and it did not happen. It was the opposite, the parents felt that they, they Actually, uh, there was decrease of stigma, sense of stigma, and, and they also felt that they were feeling better. And feasibility means that, that uh, it's, it's an intervention that, can be, that, par that families like, and it can be uh, uh, carried out in the services. You might have a very, very good evidence-based intervention, but it doesn't fit your services, so nobody will do it after a while. And so we found out that our, our methods were safe and feasible. And then the, the uh, effectiveness results. Uh, there was a reduction in children's emotional symptoms in both interventions. The FTI, the family intervention, was more effective in depression. There was equal uh, impact on decrease of anxiety, pro-social skills, and... Um, but then we had a, a, an interesting, um, unexpected uh, result. We studied the dysfunctional attributions. You know, the, the cognitive, the, the distorted cognitive schemas where, where, you know, when a person has depression, you see everything through the black glasses. And your children learn that very early on, already preschool. And it is known that if children learn this way of perceiving themselves and, and the outer world, they are more prone to depression themselves. And in the, in the interventions, uh, we focus, you know, both the interventions also focus on, on the information that, that, um, that children might think that the parents' problems are their fault. And, and so in both interventions, the, the parents are instructed to, to tell the children that, it, no, it's not your fault <laughs> if I cry a lot or if I sleep a lot or if I'm angry. So we, we uh, hypothesized that the family intervention with six to eight sessions and also meeting with kids would be more effective in this sense because we know that attributions are a little difficult to change. But the unexpected finding was that there was no change in attributions in the family talk, but there was a significant change for the better in the little intervention, in the, in the, in the less talk, which is only one, two sessions with the parent. And so what happened was that, that there was a change in positive attributions towards the better, you know, and a decrease in children's depression and emotional symptoms at one and a half 
uh, months, I mean one and a half years. And this was very puzzling. <laughs> so um, why not the longer intervention where the children were present? Oh, there's again a spelling error. Information, is it the question of information processing, issues of agency? In the family talk intervention, the information that is not your fault is given in the family session where all the family is present, all the children were present, and also there's a professional uh, kind of um, guiding the, the discussion. That's why we thought that that would be really influential. But, you know, these is issues um, come up in, I mean, um, the parents might actually think that, okay, the thing, the job is done. <laughs> it's been told to the kids and that's it. But these situations happen at home, and uh, even if we have our in inter interventions. <laughs> and so do you think that this Lisa in this situation would remember, okay, in that office a month ago, two months ago, they said that this is not my fault. <laughs> but I did spill the glass of milk. <laughs> and, and so... Um, so why the shorter intervention even without children? This information is given to the parents that, that their children might think that and you might, if you feel like it, you might tell the kids that it's not their fault. So uh, the parents were left on their own to do something about it. And, and they had to process the issue themselves. And, and we think that they might link the information into those situations where children's sense of guilt arises. And so the possible explanation might be that parents became agents of change in their family, rather than professionals in the, in the, in the family intervention. And so once the, the situation is over, the parent might go back to it and say that, hey, Lisa, it was not your fault. Children do spill glasses of milk, and parents shouldn't get that angry. It was because I, I have this problem that I have talked to you about. So, so what to make out of these findings about... Um, I think that the psychoeducation, whatever it is, and new coping skills have to be integrated into, into the actual situations in children's lives where, you know, you know the actual situations in children's lives um, where these issues happen, really, and not just kind of lecturing to kids, but they have to be part of the everyday, you know, the family life. Which means that, that parents are terribly important in this process, and parents own agency. So what I have written here is parent, parents are crucial partners in the prevention of child problems when they themselves have problems. And this is also something that I'd like you to remember, <laughs> because it's so common. It's, it has been common, it is so common, that parents with mental health problems are surpassed when decisions about their children have been made. And, and um, in our um, approach, we don't tell parents what they have to do with kids. I think earlier, before I, I uh, realized <laughs> that um, uh, in my, you know, I am a child psychiatrist, so I have worked with families a lot. So earlier on, I could say to, to a family, to a parent, to parents, yes, but now you would have to do this and this and this. Children would have to Da, da 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 and you have to do this and this and this. Okay, now I don't do it anymore. <laughs> but I, I say that, that 
Okay, in situations like yours, some families have done this and this and this. And, and um, I could say that last week I went to a seminar and I learned that also this kind of thing it could be done. What do you think? What would suit your family? Would any of this sound okay for you? So I give them all the knowledge that I have. I put it on the table. It's not psychoeducation. It's putting it on the table. And the parents are experts in their own family issues. They know what they can take, what the family can kind of uh, integrate, and they choose from what is on the table what they take. And they might take very little. They might say that none of it. And then uh, that's something that you don't, you don't pressurize them. You let them have their own process. And we have learned that you know, many times the parents take only a little piece. <laughs> but then when you see them later, you realize that they've gone all the way. Because they, the families have their own. You, know, uh, you have to respect the time, the, the process, and so on. So this, I think, is something that, that um, you know, unless you, I mean, you have to have respect for the parent and the parent's parenting, even if it has problems, if you want to work with these families. You have to understand the parent, you have to understand the child, and then, um, um, you know, build from that. Okay, so I, I started with the with our program, and 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 um, yes. Pardon me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is okay. So um, so it's I think it's been it's been a success in Finland, and uh, but however we have not. Uh, done an audit, uh, which we have tried to do it, but we haven't received money for that. And and so, um, but anyway, we have um, trainers and trained people across the country, and adult psychiatry is uh, has taken this topic up and is taking it up. Okay, I have some other slides, but I think I'll um, go to the very end. Thank you. <laughs> Peaisi.ee